The committee will come to order. After recognizing myself and the ranking member, my good friend, Mr. Berman, for seven minutes each for our opening statements, we will then proceed to hear from our witnesses. The chair would ask our witnesses to keep their oral summaries of their written testimony to more, no more than five minutes each. I'm getting quite a reputation for being ruthless with this gavel, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'll have to be uh, kinder. Okay. Following, what's that? Yeah, I know, it goes on. Following their testimonies, members will be recognized to question witnesses under the five-minute rule. Without objection, the witnesses' prepared statements will be made part of the record, and members may have five days to insert statements and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation of the rules. The chair now recognizes herself for seven minutes. <clears throat> Today we consider lessons learned from past UN reform attempts to ensure that present and future efforts are based on what works. What a concept. Lesson one, money talks. The biggest problem with the UN is that those who call the shots don't have to pay the bills. Most UN member nations pay next to nothing in assessed contributions, but work together to adopt UN programming decisions and budgets, passing the cost on to big contributors like the US. The US goes along and pays all contributions that the UN assesses to us, 22% of the UN regular budget, plus billions more each year. The current administration has unconditionally repaid our UN arrears. When the UN bureaucracy and other member countries know that we will pay in full no matter what, they have zero incentive to reform. Almost every productive US reform effort has been based on withholding our contributions unless and until needed reforms are implemented. In the 1980s, for example, Congress adopted an amendment to withhold funding until the UN changed how budgets are voted on. That effort showed some success until the amendment expired. That threat was no longer credible, and the UN returned to business as usual. In the early 90s, Arafat pushed for the PLO to gain full membership in the UN agencies, meaning the PLO would be essentially recognized as a state without making peace with Israel. The PLO strategy looked unstoppable until George H.W. Uh, Bush administration made clear that the U.S. would cut off funding to any U.N. entity that upgraded the status of the PLO. The PLO's effort was stopped in its tracks. While Arafat is gone, his successors are up to the same tricks today. The U.S. response may be just as, must be just as strong. In the 90s, when the U.N. regular and peacekeeping budgets were skyrocketing, Congress enacted the Helms-Biden Agreement. The U.S. withheld our dues and conditioned repayment on key reforms. When the U.N. saw that we meant business, they agreed to change, and that saved U.S. taxpayer funds. Smart withholding worked. Withholding alone is insufficient to produce lasting reform. That is why we must demand that funding for the U.N. budget and U.N. entities move from an assess to a voluntary basis. That way, Americans, not UN bureaucrats or other member countries, will determine how much taxpayer dollars are spent on the UN and where they go. We should pay for UN programs and activities that advance our interests and our values. If other countries want different things to be funded, they can pay for it. The voluntary model works for UNICEF and other UN entities. It can work for the UN as a whole. Lesson two. Principled, credible, consistent U.S. leadership matters. The U.S. is not just another member nation at the U.N. American leadership is what our allies expect from us and what our enemies fear. We should not be afraid to block consensus and stand up for our values and interests, even if that means standing alone, though we should lobby other responsible nations to join us. Last week, the working group reviewing the UN Human Rights Council came out with an outcome document that made no structural reforms needed to turn the council from a rogues gallery to a useful entity, even as the US criticized the review process, calling it, quote, a race to the bottom, end quote, we did not demand a vote, allowing it to be adopted by consensus. Such indecisiveness undermines our credibility 
with our allies and weakens our ability to advance our goals at the UN. Lesson three, require real reforms and don't settle for cosmetic changes. In 2006, the UN finally abolished the shameful UN Commission on Human Rights, which had fallen so far that it had been chaired by Gaddafi's Libyan regime. Instead of, instead of replacing the commission with a body based on real membership standards, the UN created a human rights council that is as bad, if not worse, than its predecessor. Even the New York Times rejected the U.S. joining the council, calling it, quote, an ugly sham offering cover to an unacceptable status quo, end quote. The majority of the council members, including China, Cuba, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, are not free nations. The council even has a permanent agenda item criticizing Israel. The council is expected to adopt several more anti-Israel resolution at the current March session. When the Council does periodically adopt resolution criticizing real human rights abuses, they are usually too little and too late. Why did it take the massacre of hundreds of people in the streets for the UN to throw Libya off the Council? Why was Gaddafi's regime permitted to join the Council to begin with? Now that the five-year review of the Council has indicated no real reforms will be forthcoming, the U.S. should finally leave the Council and explore alternative forums to advance human rights. Lesson four, don't compare apples and oranges. Some of the U.N. defenders like to cite some good U.N. activities to gain support for funding bad ones. However, we're not here to play let's make a deal. Each U.N. office, activity, program, and sub-program must be justified on its own merits and funded voluntarily. UNICEF aid to starving children cannot excuse UNRWA having members of Hamas on its payroll. To incorporate lessons learned, I will soon introduce a revised version of the United Nations Transparency, Accountability, and Reform Act, which I first introduced in 2007. Its fundamental principle will be reform first, pay later. I hope that my colleagues will join me in lending strong bipartisan support to this bill.